So, um, you know, not a big group to do, let's keep this informal. And if you've got questions as I go, just jump in and ask. Don't sort of wait, especially not if I say anything that's not clear. Please do speak up and ask. And has everyone got a pair of 3D glasses? Right. So that's what I start off with here. What is 3D vision? Here's a demonstration of a 3D image. So if you put on your glasses, and I see a couple of you, you've got the green lens over the left eye. It has to be the other way around, I'm afraid of this. So yeah, that's it. Red lens over the left eye. And then, oh, hopefully it's the easy. Oh, yeah. The thing from the Black Lagoon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good slide, isn't it? Apparently a big hit in the 1950s. You can't have that one you remember that, Nick? That's my dad. <laughs> oh. And it, one thing you might like to try is rocking from side to side slightly as you watch this. And hopefully, does it kind of move for you? Does it does have a hand yeah. appear yeah, yeah. to move? So it's really quite a powerful illusion of depth. And 3D vision, though, works not only in, in pictures like this, where obviously there are many depth cues and cues to the shape of the animal. Um, Whatever, such as you know, shape from shading and so on. 3D vision even works in really abstract images like this random dot patterns. So if you put the glasses on again, then hopefully um, you'll see a disc, I think it's in front of the screen, is it? Sort of hanging behind. there? It's behind, is yeah. it? Right. And then I think this one's in front, all right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. So if you close one eye here while still wearing the glasses, then the disc totally vanishes. Right, you just see a totally uniform field of dots. And it's only when you open both eyes that you see the disc, because the disc is defined by the relationship between the dots in the left and the right eye. Anyway, I'll go through right now. So our 3D vision, also known as stereopsis, um, helps us work out how far away things are, because it's a very direct geometrical cue to distance. So if we just have one eye, like a cyclops, then if you were looking at, say, a mountain and a tree, you might be able to work out which was in front from cues such as occlusion, if one's blocking off part of the other, and size, and so on. But because we have two eyes, we have this very direct way of working out where objects are in space. So if I colour code the left and right eye's view in red and blue, and let's suppose you're looking at the mountain, then, kind of by definition, the mountains are appearing at the same place in both eyes' images, but the tree, if you notice, it's over to the right in the left eye's view and over to the left in the right eye's view. So it's got what's called the binocular, binocular disparity, a difference between the position of the tree and the two eyes' images. And your brain can detect this disparity and use it to work out where objects are located relative to one another in space. And that's what gives us 3D depth perception. I just want to introduce a couple of points which are going to recur later. I want to point out that the fixated object always has zero disparity, so it's appearing at the same position in both eyes, and objects at other distances have some non-zero disparity. And another way of representing that kind of geometry, which I'm going to use later on, is this kind of top-down view of the eyes. So if you imagine looking at this object here, it projects as a fovea in both eyes, again, kind of by definition, because that's what it means to fixate something. An object at a different distance will project to different locations in the two retinas, so it will have a disparity. Is everyone clear on that kind of geometry before we go forward? Super. So, I know not most of you, I guess, are not stereo vision people, so I thought it'd be worth starting out with a kind of why bother? Why, why should you bother to study this ability? And I think there's a bunch of reasons actually, so I wanted to just run through them quickly. I think it's a really good model system for understanding perception for a variety of reasons. First of all, as you just see, the geometry is essentially very, very simple. It's a really well-defined problem compared to something like, I don't know, face recognition or emotion processing, where even writing down what we're trying to achieve is far from trivial. It's solved at a low level, which I think that's demonstrated very nicely here by this random dot pattern, which is obviously a highly unnatural abstract stimulus, unlike anything you would encounter in everyday life. And yet, as you've just seen, your stereo vision works really well on it. And such images were very influential when they were first uh, invented in the 60s by a guy called Bela Ulesh, because people realised this meant disparity alone suffices to define objects. Previously, people had kind of Imagine that 3D vision works by, you, know, you you figure out the image of Wendy in my left eye, the image of Wendy in my right eye, and I match those up. But here, the disc is not visible in either eye individually. It's only visible in the relationship between the two. And so 
what people think that shows is that stereo vision is working not on abstract, complicated, high-level things like, image, like objects, Wendy, Tame or whatever, but really low-level retinal properties of the retinal image. And that again is encouraging because if it's very low level and kind of bottom up, that makes it simpler. It makes us more likely to understand it. It's also probably a sort of module of vision which can be plugged in and out if you like. If you cover one eye, obviously you lose some of your visual field, but other than that, not a whole lot changes. And I think that's rather amazing when you consider in the brain we have loads of binocular neurons and huge, loads of brain areas which seem to be involved somehow in stereo vision and yet when I turn my stereo vision off and on and off and on vision kind of continues relatively unperturbed and if that means stereopsis or 3D vision is kind of on its own as a module which can be plugged into vision then again it's probably more isolated and easier to study on its own. It also illustrates some really important principles which apply to all vision, or probably all perception, in that it's believed to depend on assumptions and experience, which we might have either through our lives as an individual, or possibly even hardwired in through our genetic code, and those are believed to help us achieve 3D vision. Just as a practical example, we've learned a lot about the physiology of stereopsis from the fact that it can be studied in, in monkeys, and monkeys can be trained to report their 3D depth perceptions. So now you can study physiology and psychophysics in the same organism, and that helps you relate the activity of neurons to the perception of the whole animal. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. So that's really helped us make progress in this area. And finally, if you're interested specifically in what the cortex contributes, this structure that's so elaborated in humans relative to other animals, well, binocular processing begins in visual cortex, not in the subcortical areas such as the thalamus or optic nerve or other visual areas. So it's kind of a good aspect of vision to look at if you want to ask what specifically does the cortex contribute to visual processing. I like it because it kind of offers all these opportunities to link psychophysics, physiology and computational modelling in a really helpful way. But, so all that's kind of from a basic science point of view, but it's also got, um, dare I say, impact in other areas. Uh, it's got clinical relevance because disorders of binocular vision are actually really common and problematic. So in this child, you see the binocular system has kind of gone awry in some way in that she's not able to align her eyes. She has a strabismus. And if left untreated, that can cause problems such as amblyopia, where one eye becomes effectively blind just because the brain stopped listening to it. If the business arises in an old person, um, which account for a number of reasons, ranging from thyroid disease um, to various nerve palsies, then the fact that the eyes are pointing in different directions gives you double vision, which is really problematic and disabling and unpleasant for people. So understanding how our binocular vision works normally could shed insight into what's gone wrong in these pathologies and how one might treat them. Finally, it's got uh, increasing industrial relevance. We're all aware that 3D displays are getting more and more common due to various technical breakthroughs. We've got 3D TV, cinema, even smartphones nowadays. So it's got in, uh, interest for the entertainment industries, but it's also got applications <coughs> anywhere where you need to visualise something and you want it to look realistic and get a really good sense of the shape and the structure of something. So in the oil industry, for example, or in medical imaging, where you want a good idea of you know, the, the contents of someone's chest, where their lungs are, so it can help a radiologist identify tumours if they're looking at the structure in 3D. So in keyhole surgery, you can give a surgeon a stereo view, and then that helps them judge distances within the body when they're operating, looking down a microscope. So it's got all these applications as well, which, again, to make them work well, depend on a good understanding of human 3D vision. So I hope you can to convince you that it's worth studying 3D vision. So now on to what I'm actually going to cover in this talk. Um, I want to talk about basically how good our 3D vision is and why, what limits it. So I'm going to be talking quite a lot about the neuronal basis of stereopsis. And also, as I was writing this, a kind of theme that emerged that I found myself returning to is that of information processing within the visual system. So at successive levels in the visual hierarchy, what information gets transmitted and what gets abandoned and not processed further. This is the kind of who did the work type talk. Um, I wanted to point out that Frederick is currently looking for a job, although we won't be very much longer because he's, he's an excellent postdoc. 
Um, and here are some of the references. Uh, I'm going to talk a lot actually about my own work because I want to keep this quite sort of general and talk about general issues rather than kind of very narrow technical stuff. But if you're interested, those are some of the papers that touch on what I'm going to talk about that will come from my lab. Okay, so how good is our 3D? Well, it's got one very severe limitation. It only works near where we're looking. So if you ask people to use their 3D vision to do a task like this, for example, to say, is this probe in front of or behind the reference surface there? They can do it really well when the probe is close to the fixation plane, close to where the person is looking in space. But as the probe moves a long way from the fixation plane, the probe reference, then people get really bad and they need to have a big disparity between the probe and the reference in order to do the task. And that again has got implications for industry. It means that people who are making 3D, 3D content, 3D TV and so on, have to be careful to put their 3D content near the screenplay. So this advertising image has the football shooting out of the screen. But actually, you're kind of limited in how far it can come out of the screen. If it comes out very well, very, very far, our 3D vision will stop working and it will look terrible. So they have to keep everything very close to the screenplay. So that's one severe limitation of our 3D vision. When we are considering places near fixation, then our 3D vision is really, really precise. And I think we'd have to agree that it's very good there. So I think it helps to compare luminance processing, which we're probably more familiar with, with disparity processing. So let's think about the minimum detectable amount that we can see. If you're talking about the minimum detectable disparity, well, actually, humans can detect disparity differences of around five seconds of arc. So a second of arc being a 60th of a minute of arc, which is a 60th of one degree, if you think about on a protractor. So that's tiny. And it turns out to be around one-sixth of a photoreceptor on the retina, which at first sight sounds near impossible. Like how can you detect a difference across the eyes that's not <coughs> one photoreceptor? That's amazing. And it's known as hyperacuity, kind of almost unbelievably good performance. Is that in the horizontal flow? That's a great question. It's only horizontal disparity, so it'll be near fixation and it'll be something that's coming towards you a tiny amount. What about vertical disparity? That is an excellent question. I don't know for sure. My guess is much less because you wouldn't even perceptually see that such a tiny difference. You wouldn't perceive it. Your eyes would just automatically correct for it, so there wouldn't be a vertical disparity on the retina. And then there's nothing to perceive. Do you see what I mean? Um, although I guess... This is talking about a relative disparity, so I suppose you could have a relative vertical disparity, but I I, you would not be able to perceive such a small difference, because vertical disparity doesn't give a percept of depth in the same way as horizontal disparity does, and it's this depth that you're perceiving. So one thing I want to ask you is, <coughs> we're talking about disparities here, and, and you define it very clearly, and I understand that. Um, But in all your geometric representations of aqua motor situations, the point of fixation is represented as one where the two lines of sight from each eye are aligned perfectly on one uh, point in space. Well, that's kind of the definition of fixation. So if the, gaze, if the optic axes of the eyes don't intersect, which does happen sometimes, then you're not fixating any one point in space. Sure, but if you imagine that they're fixating, so if you, could you go back to one of your mm. pictures with two eyes on? Uh, that's well, that's yeah. fine, yeah. Mm -hmm. So here, the blue, the blue. So, so the point of fixation is behind the blue screen. It's, or yeah, exactly. It's right. and you've got your probe relative to the reference plane. But so, in fact, we've done quite a lot of work now showing that the eyes alignment. Relative, say you were required to fixate on a point at, at that point where those two lines of sight intersect. Right. In fact, the two lines of sight do not, very, very often, do not align on that point. So the disparity, I think this adds a level of complexity to the issue. I don't think it contradicts anything that you've said at all, um, but it just means that the, um, it seems to me that it means that the issue is not one of disparity relative to some well, it is. It's, one, it's an issue of, of, of disparity relative to a, a, a point of fixation, but quite where that point of fixation is, given a requirement to fixate a point in space, 
is not necessarily the same as it would be if they were perfectly aligned with that point in space. Right, so it could be a small fixation, I suppose. I guess the sort of page I'm thinking of, there's a highly cited Blake Moore 71, I think it is, plotting the smallest disparity you can see yeah. as a function of pedestal disparity from, I guess, there it's the screen play, and Troy calls this fixation play, but what he means is I'm asking them to fixate this screen, and I'm assuming they are. And it's best at the screen plane and it increases away from it. And I guess what you're saying is if you weren't fixating that plane but you were still best at zero retinal That's right. disparity, then that parabola, if you like, would be offset from the screen plane. I'm saying that in that task, I think that it's a fair, I, I understand what you're saying, I agree with it. But, and seeing the minimum at that point is very, very interesting. Given that, I can assure you that on probably 70% of the fixations of that plane, their eyes were not fixating at that point in depth, but either beyond it or in front of it. Right. So when, the, but the, as, a, as far as I'm aware, everyone finds their peak sensitivity <coughs> is on the screen plane. So what that would imply to me is if you if they're going around the world and every time they're trying to look at yeah. this they're actually fixating a bit in front here or a bit behind or, or a bit you know for the sake of argument yeah. one person it's constant so it might be a little bit in front yeah. everywhere then they still develop peak sensitivity for That's where right. they were trying to look. That's right. So I'm going to talk later on about neurons that have zero disparity and say the more that zero disparity and in those people presumably it's all offset a little bit. Yeah. So they've got most neurons with you know, 0.2 degrees disparity or whatever their offset is. Mm. So it kind of works, but everything is, is shifted a little bit relative to zero. I think that's exactly the point <coughs> I'm making, yeah. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, just because I'm trying to get through a <laughs> lot in, in under an hour, there were a lot of simplifications in this. Sure. Um, and, you know, I guess that's one of them. <coughs> Okay, so in terms of minimum detectable amount, both disparity and luminance are really fabulous. You know, we can detect one photon, which is a kind of quantum efficiency limit, and we can detect sub -photo receptor. No one could engineer a system to do better than that, I would suggest. But in terms of spatial resolution, to so the level of detail with which we can detect variation, then there's a big difference between luminance and disparity. And disparity is actually pretty rubbish. So, to assess the level of detail we can see, I guess in an, an optometrist clinic they tend to use something like this melon chart and look at you know, what the finest level of detail is that you can perceive. Something I always think, <laughs> the number of vision talks I've been to where someone would put up a slide something like this, <laughs> they've clearly forgotten all about the human acuity limit. But there is one and you can't read stuff like that. <laughs> So vision scientists tend not to use Snellen charts, but to quantify the resolution limit by using what's called a sinusoidal luminance grating. So that's a pattern like this, where the brightness is varying as a function, as a sinusoidal function of position. That's shown on there. Okay, is that sort of clear to everyone? Super. And so what you do is you increase the frequency, so you know that the number of strikes per unit area. And you see how high you can make that frequency before it simply appears grey to the observer. So in this room, probably all of you can see the stripes even at the right, but clearly if it were a great big hall, then at the back, over there on the right, it would just look uniform grey because it would be beyond your limit of resolution. Now to do this in the sort of disparity domain, you can use a sinusoidal disparity grating. So that is a surface that's depicted in space as kind of, I always think of it like corrugated iron on a roof. You know, uh, oscillating like that. So this is a random dot pattern, a bit like the one you saw earlier, but if you put your glasses on, hopefully most of you will see a sheet undulating in depth. Yeah, is that working for most people? Where am I supposed to see? <laughs> <laughs> what I'd like you to see is that, I don't know if it comes out or behind. It goes behind. It goes behind there in the screen. Yeah, yeah, out, out, and then runs to the top, yeah. So it's like there's a, imagine there's a black sheet with dots painted on it and it was billowing in space like that. I mean, static, but corrugated. So how that's generated, if you take the glasses off, you can see the disparities. So we've got these, over here we've got the red dot on the left and the, um, and the right eyes dot on the right. So it's depicting something behind the screen. And here, they're both superimposing, so these dots are depicted <coughs> on the screen plane. And here, the dot is depicted in front of the screen. That geometry is clear to everyone. Right, and now, 
This is a similar grating, but now the frequency is higher, so the, the corrugations are happening more rapidly as you go up the screen. Is that everyone seeing that? Yeah. And here's one where it's more rapid still, and I'm not sure if you'll all see that, or for some of you, it may just look like a kind of random assortment of dots, and you may have kind of lost the grating corrugation structure. <laughs> is anyone seeing a grating now, or is it just going yeah, 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 yeah. You can all see it, so yeah, yeah. clearly it's not yet high enough frequency. But ultimately, if you make it high enough frequency, then you lose the ability to see the corrugation, and it just looks like kind of a thickened wodge of dots. How much does that depend on the dot density? It does depend. Well, you can, what you want to avoid is that you're kind of trivially, the limit is imposed by the dot density. Yeah. So if you've, like, you've got a kind of Nyquist limit, <coughs> by, you know, yeah. well, I couldn't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, but if you make sure the dots are small enough, that the Nyquist limit is well above, you know, okay. the human visual limit, then you know you're actually testing the human visual system and not some trivial side effect of your stimulus. Okay. And then it's a fixed and gradient. Then it's, you write there's a disparity gradient in it, so what we're just touching on is that whether or not you can see a gradient depends not only on its frequency but also its amplitude. So you might be able to see a gradient at a particular frequency if it was low amplitude, but if it was made very, very corrugated, you wouldn't be able to see it. Okay. Yeah, so there's that trade-off between the two. But you know, there are some gradients, there are some frequencies where you'll never be able to see it at any amplitude. Um, so to do to work out what that limit is, you can do a grating detection task. So in the signal interview, if you like, people are viewing a corrugated pattern which is sort of sketched out. So this is a screen where in fact all the dots are on the screen like they are in the image I just showed you, but they appear to be in front of and behind the screen. And then the noise interval, you take exactly the same distribution of disparities, but you scramble the positional relations. So you, th there isn't a grating structure, but there's the same distribution of disparities. And you ask people, is there or is there not a grating present in this image? And you see when they fall to chance. And when you do that, you find that for disparity gratings, you can only see them up to about three or four cycles per degree which is why I guess it's feasible that, you know, to get under the Nyquist limit, which is way lower than for luminance, because for luminance you can go up to 50 or 60 cycles per degree. So <coughs> it's magnitude worse for disparity than it is for luminance. And again, that's an important fact for us to know, and various people are trying to exploit that in the 3D industry. So one of the problems with, you know, the new HD 3D televisions is it instantly doubles the bandwidth if you want to transmit an HD image for the left eye and one for the right eye. So people are thinking, can you get around it by transmitting one HD you know, full colour image that's just flat, and then transmit a low resolution disparity map, and then the television can be clever enough to use the disparity map to reconstruct left and right HD images, and then obviously you save on bandwidth. So, again, knowing how human perception works has all sorts of implications for how to engineer 3D display systems. Can I ask you a quick question mm. there? So, in normal viewing, it's absolutely fine for me if I'm fixating on the screen and there's a football here. That doesn't bother me. So why does it bother me when it's a stereo television? Or why that that is great. The most obvious answer will be accommodation. So the okay. physical object with the huge so disparity will appear yeah. massively blurred because it's way out of focus. Okay. And, and the trouble is, with a 3D display, there is no way to actually make it out of focus. So putting a blurred image on a screen is not the same as having a genuinely defocused physical image. So, you know, you can't do that. And secondly, even if people do try and do it by putting the disparate object, they give it a blur. Even if that looks okay if you're fixating over here, if the person wants to look around that 3D scene and fixate the object over here, suddenly it looks terrible because it's all blurred. Yeah. <laughs> and so is that blur conflict, is it? That's, that's that seems to be the major reason. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So yeah, yeah, that's exactly a problem with <laughs> the industry there. Okay. So I've highlighted these two facts about 3D vision. It only works close to where we're looking and it's not very detailed. And now I want to talk about why that is. And both of those facts stem from the properties of primary visual cortex, so this area in the occipital lobe um, where the optic radiations terminate. And it's got a particular significance because it's the first place in the visual system where you find binocular neurons. So these are individual nerve cells which are receiving input from both the left and the right eye. 
in earlier stages of the visual system, such as the lateral geniculate nucleus and the thalamus, there were neurons from left eye and right eye, but they're kept segregated into different layers. You don't find these binocular neurons. And for that reason, um, V1 has been dubbed the cyclopean retina, the first place where binocular information is available within the visual system. And I'll talk a lot about how this barrett is encoded and represented there. So in V1, you find neurons which are sensitive to binocular disparity. <coughs> and this is uh, an example of a neuron from the lab I used to work in over at the National Institutes of Health. And this neuron was being shown hundreds and hundreds of these random dot images. In fact, it was <coughs> randomly generated anew every time with different disparities. And we're, they're all interleaved randomly, but at the end of the experiment, you take all the uh, trials on which the cells saw a disparity with, say, minus one degree, and you calculate the average fire rate during that 200 millisecond window. And, you know, similarly for all the different disparities. And you find this very clear structure. So this is a cell which prefers a disparity of around minus a quarter degree. So it's firing about 25 spikes per second there. And for a disparity of zero, so that would be on the screen plane, then it's firing much less at around only five spikes per second. So this cells are V1, right? It is. Yeah. Of a monkey. Yeah. So that's such neurons. <laughs> I believe well, they, they have they're receiving information clearly from both eyes, otherwise they wouldn't be able to encode the relationship between the two of them. So they've got a receptive field on both the left and the right eye's retina. And roughly speaking, <laughs> the cell's preferred disparity depends on the offset between those receptor fields on the two retinas. So if the left and right receptor fields are in the same location mm -hmm. in the two eyes, the cell will prefer zero disparity. If they're offset like this, it might prefer a far disparity, so that's something you know, behind the screen. If they're offset the other way around, it will respond best to a near disparity. Again, that's an oversimplification, as those of you who know this literature will be aware, but I think it's, it's the right level for this kind of talk. OK, so that then is what limits the range of disparities we can see. It's the sort of cells you have in your V1. Jenny, just, mm. just before you leave that previous slide, sure. is, that, is that the case for those cells at fixation, at fixation then? These cells are fixed on the retina. Yeah. So they don't mind where you're fixating, it's yeah. simply that where you're fixating determines <coughs> what, what the disparity is on the retina. So those cells are in V1, right? And I realise that the different rela the relationship, the mapping between one eye and the other eye is somehow catching the degree of disparity, whether it's before the screen or behind the screen. Mm -hmm. But um, are retinal cells uniquely coded to those? How, what's the relationship between the retinal cells and those V1 areas, right? Well, the V1 cells appear to be looking at a a patch of photoreceptors that are fixed on the retina. Yeah, okay. So it's groups of it's groups of retinal cells that are feeding into these V1 cells. Right. right. And so they're taking patterns of patterns of activation in the different retina. retina. Uh, yeah, okay, I've got it. Exactly. So right. these little colour codes that I've put on, yeah. they're meant to colour code whether or not there is photoreceptors, roughly speaking, inside that nerve cell or inhibit it. We're going to yeah. get onto that okay. in a little bit. But so it's, 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 a, it's a complicated thing to, to, because this relationship is always changing. So if I'm, imagine I've got two objects yeah. here and I fixate this one, then it has zero disparity and a cell like this one will be firing happily because you know, it's seeing something with zero disparity. If I now change my gaze to this distant figure, now this near one doesn't have zero disparity anymore, it's now got a big crossed disparity and that cell would no longer be firing to it. So as you look around the scene, and we do that every, you know, a couple of times every second, the relationship's changing all the time. I'm just trying to figure out there should be one peak. I'm thinking there should be one peak, but on the previous slide it looked like you had a peak on the minus and the plus sides at about the same location. Yeah, so you find, that's a great question, <coughs> you find V1 cells have a, a variety of patterns um, they're generally well modelled by a Gabor function, which is what this fit is. That's a sine wave multiplied by a Gaussian. And yeah, many cells look like this. Many of them have one peak. Many of them have this little cartoon that I did here where they've got a central peak and then two little side lobes. Some of them have approximately equal peak and trough. Some of them have a central trough. And there's a kind of zoology of cells. So this is why I sketched here would be called a tuned excitatory cell. 
<laughs> this one here would be called a near cell because it's referring to this near disparity. Also, sometimes called an odd symmetric cell because it's kind of got this approximate symmetry that you could um, rotate it around by 180 degrees and it would look the same. You see what I mean? But alternatively, you could reflect it and then invert it and it would look the same. It's odd symmetric. So there's a whole bunch of them. And that's believed to depend on the particular receptor field patterns that they receive input from. So, yeah, <laughs> we're kind of on top of that. We pretty much understand where it comes from. Um, and I haven't run into it here, so it, but it, I guess I caused the sort of confusion by having the, a, a, an example cell that was different from my little cartoons here. But basically, there's a variety of them. It depends on what the receptor fields look like. But this point about the offset roughly controlling where the peak is holds for all of them. And then it's the arrangement of on and off units within the receptor field that controls the details of how, how, many, how deep the side lobes are. So. <coughs> okay, so we, you've, I guess you are all familiar with the concept of retinotopy, so that ultimately photoreceptors that are adjacent in the retina end up projecting to neurons that are adjacent in visual cortex. And stereo vision is only a small kind of perturbation on top of that. So cortical neurons tend to receive input, ultimately, from receptive fields that are at very similar locations in the two eyes. And we don't have cells like this one where I've sketched here, where you know, this cell is looking way over to the right, this receptor field is looking way over to the visual field right, and this one is looking way over to the left of the visual field. That doesn't happen. We don't have such neurons in our visual cortex. And that is why we cannot see these huge disparities. So the, certainly in monkeys, because obviously it's only in monkeys we can really do these experiments, the range of disparity tuning goes up to around plus or minus a degree max with a big peak at zero, which very much ties into what we were talking about earlier, at being able to see things close to fixation with your best performance at zero disparity. So that's all kind of making sense. Mm, cool. So when you have diplopia, do yeah. you still have some sense of depth? How does that tie into the... Okay, so my guess is going to be... So what we're referring to is that there are some stimuli that are diplopics and they've got such a big disparity, like an isolated bar stimulus on this phone. If I, if I fixate the wall, this phone appears diplopic to me, I can see two copies of it. But even in such diplopic images, people can still make depth judgments. You, know, you can flash them up very briefly so they don't, people don't have a chance to make a virgins movement. And then you can say, did you see one bar or two? Like two, because it was diplopic. Did it appear in front of or behind the screen? And they can tell you. They can give you an answer that matches the disparity of that bar. And what Wendy's saying is, well, if that bar's diplopic because you haven't got any disparity between neurons, how did you know about the depth? Yes. <laughs> that was nicely re rephrased as what I was talking about. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think we don't have a definite answer to that. There's not a paper I can point to that says, we, this proves this is how it works. But my belief is that that's tapping into one of the many different stereo systems that we have. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you touch on this? Was it yesterday we about the um, head centric disparity, wasn't it, in Cliff Shaw's work? So, I think we have a fine, we have fine stereopsis, which probably works with these neurons I'm talking about. They're retina centric and they do fine detail and they solve random dot patterns and so on. I think we also have a very coarse and crude system of stereopsis, which may, exactly, which may, for example, it may be important for sensing eye movement, so you've got a, a double image, clearly your burnness is wrong, you need to move your eyes either converged or diverged, so you need some way of detecting rough side, and that may use a completely different set of neurons. Um, I don't believe, in fact, I'm sure no one, has, no one has reported that you can do that kind of depth discrimination in random dot patterns with a big disparity, I don't know. If, if you could, that would shoot my argument down. Yeah. But I believe that random block patterns with a big disparity just look a complete mess. Yeah. And you can't tell what the sign of the disparity is. And that's because these neurons, you know, it's gone out of range. That's the way it feels, doesn't it? Because it feels like it's, it's diplopic and then as soon as you've got a few depths, that's what you're saying. It, that, that's what it feels, and that's the same instant that you have the depth. Yeah. So you don't have the diplopic with the depth. Yeah. Exactly. And that's my belief that the fusion is necessary for these neurons to do the work. But you also have a cruder. Uh, system that probably works with a completely different 
um, neuronal machinery, probably based on where, figuring out where each eye is pointing and then working out where in heterosynthetic space. So just objectives. another question that makes that then. So at the beginning you were saying how um, correspondence, whatever, statement is all bottom up, but I thought there was <laughs> evidence to say that there's some top down in there as well. But So I thought that you were faster to get depth from stereograms when there's some top down depth in there. And is that because it's helping to drive the correct version of time movements then? Ooh, great question. I'm not, I'm not sure I know the evidence that you're referring to there. Okay, don't worry. So we'll keep that later, but if you yeah. probably didn't move, that would be good. Yeah. Um, but you, you are, you, you're catching me out on these image indications I should do. Because, <laughs> <laughs> for example, you know, my selling it is, ah, look, the fact that you, you can do stereo with random dot patterns, you know, that proves that it works like this. Strictly, that proves there is at least one system in the brain that works like this. Yeah. There are actually several, and that's something that's kind of dawning on me increasingly. The <laughs> <laughs> systems. Okay. But I guess most of what I'm talking about today is what you might call fine stereo. <coughs> okay, so what limits the resolution then um, in which we encode vision? So back to this V1 receptor field, okay, and now this is why I bothered colour coding it, because I wanted to use red to represent an on region, meaning that's an area of the retina where if you put a bright stimulus, it tends to excite the cortical neuron and make it fire action potentials. Conversely, if you put up something that's darker than the mean luminance, it tends to silence the cell. But you also find off regions of receptor fields where dark stimuli tend to excite the neuron and bright stimuli tend to suppress their firing. And in the simplest possible model of how these cells respond, when you put up an image on the retina, you can point multiply the luminance at each point with the receptor field function at each point, add up all those numbers, and that is the firing rate of the cell. It's a very crude model, but it works surprisingly well. Is that in terms of absolute luminance that I'm not no, no, it's all like relative to your current adaptation state and so on. Um, okay, so let's think then how this cell is going to respond to different luminance gratings. So a zero frequency luminance grating is just a uniform patch of luminance, so it could be black, in which case the on region is not going to be very happy, it's going to be inhibiting the cell. The off region is going to be trying to excite the cell, but those two are going to cancel out and you won't have very much fire. Ditto, whether this is grey or white, it doesn't matter, the same thing's going to happen. Okay, now suppose you put up a little grating patch that's just like this. Well, now you can see the on region of the cell is going to be happy because it's seeing a bright stimulus. You've got to imagine sliding this down over the receptor field. And the off region is going to be happy because it's seeing a little patch of darkness. So you're going to get a nice, strong response from this cell. But if you make the frequency too high, then neither of them is particularly active because they're just getting a mixture of good and bad stimuli, so neither part of the receptor field is driving the cell, and again, you get a reduced response. So the spatial frequency tuning curve of this cell is going to be band pass, that means it peaks at intermediate frequencies, and the frequency it peaks at depends on the width of these little on and off regions. So that would be the optimal luminance grating for this particular cell. <coughs> okay, now let's think about binocular neurons. So imagine you've got two identical receptor fields like this. Well, you can see that it's great. if we're talking about the disparity, it's going to be optimal when the stimulus is the same in both eyes. Because whenever you figured out what's good for one eye, it's also going to be good for the other eye. So zero disparity is always going to drive this cell best. And if you have some non-zero disparity, it can't be as good. But critically, the optimal stimulus has got a constant offset. The optimal offset will depend on the offset between the receptive fields as we've been through. But whatever it is, it's going to be the same all over the receptive fields because there isn't any structure within the receptive field that will change that. And um, this is an experimental paper which demonstrates that indeed V1 neurons really do respond best to stimuli that have the same disparity all over the cell's receptive field. So whereas the spatial frequency tuning curve was band pass, the disparity tuning curve is what's called low pass. So the cell will respond best to a uniform patch of whatever its preferred disparity is. It might be zero, it might be 0.1 degree or whatever. But critically, it should be uniform. And if you introduce any changes, any slant or curvature, <coughs> then the cell won't fire as much. So 
That stems from the fact that VRON receptor fields have these on and off subregions for luminance, which means that their optimal stimulus is actually non zero frequency. But they don't have substructure for disparity. They prefer the same disparity all over their receptor field. So they prefer little front and parallel patches rather than more complicated curvy structures. That's just recapping what I said, really. And that means the size of the one receptor field is what is limiting the resolution with which we encode disparity. But that's not true for luminance. For luminance, it's the size of these little subregions which are finite. And maybe that's not the whole story because the, the difference isn't necessarily an order of magnitude, but that certainly goes a long way to explaining the enhanced resolution we have for luminance relative to disparity. So, constant disparity on a <coughs> this point corresponds to a front of parallel surface being something that's straight onto me. So, in a top down view, V1 neurons are tuned to little patches of this surface, not little patches of this complicated curvy slanty surface. Well, putting it in less technical language, perhaps, I think of it as like the visual theme in depth is made up of old fashioned Lego bricks. Not these newfangled Lego bricks <laughs> that you buy nowadays. <laughs> I'm with you. Yeah, it's shocking, isn't it? But it's not real Lego, let's face it. Yeah, exactly. So if you construct a theme, <laughs> we do have cells in our brain which are tuned to disparity, slant, and curvature. They've been found and identified in monkeys and so on, but they're in higher visual areas, they're not in V1. And the picture that's emerging is that they're built up from these V1 units that are tuned to little chunks. So it's just like you can make a complicated surface from a bunch of old fashioned Lego bricks, but you're going to be limited to how delicate you can make it by the size of the bricks. Can I ask a question now? Yeah. For this? So can you go back mm. two slides? So, okay, three. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. yeah. So <laughs> this is where, you know, when I asked that original question about, you know, what we've what we've shown actually about the point of fixation. This is why I think it's a more, <coughs> I might be wrong here, but it feels like it's more complex than these diagrams lead one to believe in the sense that um, the point of, what I know is that there is very, so this is all coming down to cross retinal correspondences and on off patterns, right? Patterns of, patterns of, patterns of groups of cells working together as almost teams mm -hmm. and, and their correspondences, retinal correspondences. Now, when one assumes that the, the point of fixation is perfectly aligned in space in the way that you're representing it here, mm -hmm. then it, it's almost like a straightforward mapping. But if you add noise onto that, then the correspondence issue becomes much more complex, right? It can't be as precise as this area mapping onto this or this particular region. It, 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 then you've got to add a, almost like a, a super, super level of noise over the top of it to say actually it could be within these ranges. And the correspondence argument, I can't help but think, I, I, haven't, I haven't, I've no empirical data or, 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 or theoretical position statement that, 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 that in which I've argued this formally, but it seems to me that the correspondence argument is an oversimplification. Okay, so several things that are you talking about when you say noise, you're talking about <coughs> noise. Well, I'm not calling it noise because I spent my life measuring that noise. But be your, I think you're referring to it as noise, which is this idea of the two eyes not being perfectly aligned at the point in space. Yes. Well, with respect to over time, so I guess I call if there's a difference in mean, then that's just a static fixation disparity, and if there's fluctuation over time, so, that's that's right. I, I, so I'm saying that there's, I can I can assure you, I know for a fact that there's both. Mm -hmm. So we, yeah, in the monkeys we measured both, and there would be, yeah. you, you, frankly, <coughs> we found it very hard to actually measure the vertex noise because it was similar to the instrument noise. And this was using scale search yeah, 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 yeah. which are um, pretty good actually. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it seems that there is a certain amount of noise, but it's very small, it's really amazingly good. And also what that does, if you, it just, so I've drawn this surface through fixation, but that isn't important, I could have drawn it yeah. away from fixation, yeah. because my point here is merely that it's straight onto you, if you like, it's uniform, yeah. disparity, not slanted. And so any vergence noise is just going to jitter this backwards and forwards. Yeah, okay. So you can think of it as like the thickness of this line. Yeah, okay. Okay, thanks. Cool. Great, so I've got this picture there where you're building up a 3D percept of the world, but out of Lego bricks, you know, the old-fashioned sort, and therefore that's limiting 
the level of detail that we can perceive. And actually, when you do computer models, which I didn't think you'd appreciate, you're going through you know, enormous detail, so I haven't. <laughs> but when you do, it actually matches up really well between the size of V1 receptive fields and the level of detail that humans can see in you know, creating random dot patterns and so on. So I mentioned earlier that one of my themes is going to be what information arises. So I want to point out here that we've suffered this catastrophic loss of information. So in the photoreceptor activations of the two retinas, potentially you have complete disparity information available at, with the same resolution as luminance, up to all disparities, you know, like 40 degrees disparity between the extreme end of one eye you know, versus the other, and we throw almost all of that away. And in V1, we encode only this low resolution disparity information for a small range on either side of fixation. And I think it's worth pointing that out. The machine doesn't have to be done. Machine stereo algorithms tend not to do this. So this is an output from a, a machine study that left and right images. It's a stereo library where you can look up you know, how, and compare different stereo algorithms. And many of them will get a beautiful disparity map like this with these fabulous sharp edges and they'll be able to encode the complete range of depths that are present in the scene. But humans will not. We're not that good. And I think it's clearly not a mystery why we do this. You know, our brain already contains billions and billions of neurons just processing what we do process. It's clearly very expensive to decode all this information. We don't represent most of the information we could have about depth from our etony, presumably because it, there wasn't an evolutionary advantage to having it. Apparently, we only need relatively coarse 3D vision, which is an interesting point to bear in mind. But there's another bottleneck that I want to talk about, and that's the fact that, interestingly, not all the information even available in V1 reaches perception, which is maybe less obvious why that would be. I think one great example uh, concerns anticorrelated stereograms. So these are a, a weird thing cooked up by vision scientists. It's a random dot pattern, but you swap over black and white dots between the eyes. So hopefully it's kind of clear from that picture what's gone on. And unsurprisingly, when you do that, you don't get a depth percept at all. And people and monkeys are completely at chance if you ask them to say, does this look in front of or behind the screen? No idea, it just looks a complete mess. But interestingly, when you record from a monkey brain, it does not look like a complete mess. So here's the disparity tuning curve for a conventional correlated random dot pattern, much like the one you saw before. Here is the response from the same cell to anti-correlated stimuli. And you can see that if you imagine asking the experimenter to distinguish between plus or minus 0.1 degree disparity armed only with his electrodes, he'd be able to perform at 100%, right, just by comparing the spiking rate of this one neuron out of the untold millions in this monkey's V1. And yet the monkey itself can't do it, even though it's clearly highly motivated, and this is how it earns its daily water and so on. So it's kind of amazing that that information, which is absolutely there in V1, is apparently totally erased from perception. So that's my first example of information that gets thrown away in V1. But you might not think it's too impressive because really people tend to interpret anticorrelated, the lack of depth in anticorrelated as kind of being a success for the visual system. You've got to figure out which of these dots match up. And clearly a white dot in one eye cannot match a black dot in the other eye. So the fact that we fail to perceive depth is actually a success of our visual system. So you can argue it's sensible that we throw away anticorrelated disparity. It would not have benefited us in evolution only in some weird vision science experiment. So I've got another example for you, which I really like, I, I love this paper. Um, you remember this point about we're better when the uh, reference is near the fixation plane and we're a bit rubbish when the reference is far from the fixation plane, okay? Well, a paper from Susanna McKee's lab looked at that using an illusion known as the wallpaper illusion, which you may even have noticed, and maybe you'll, if I tell you about it, maybe you'll notice it in, you yeah. know, Another occasion. If, you, if you're ever in an environment where they have these sort of stripy wallpaper with a very periodic repeating pattern, personally I think it looks terrible, but you can actually get them in the paper like this. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, one. <laughs> Occasionally you'll get this weird illusion where you look at it and it's like, whoa, the stripes appear to be in front of the wall, not on the wall. And what's going on there is that your brain's trying to match up left and right eyes, but if the same thing is occurring many times in left and right eyes, you don't know which to match, and sometimes you get it wrong. So they, what they did was you put up an, an image like that, these grating patterns, and 
the only difference between these two situations is the offset of the, the global pattern. So it's the edges that's different, okay, between these two situations. And so your brain, most of the time, can use the edges, as long as it's not a vast, you know, like a paper which covers a visual field. If the edges are visible, you can use those edges to work out um, these are the things that match up, so it's at this depth, where in this pattern, it's at a different depth because of the edges, even though locally the images are the same. But that's a critical point. So as far as B1 neurons are concerned, B1 neurons have got these very small, fine receptive fields to give you your good detailed vision. So within that receptive field, the <coughs> these yellow circles, nothing has changed between these two stimuli. And indeed, another paper confirms that indeed B1 neurons respond exactly the same in these two situations because they're completely blind to what's happening out here way beyond their receptive field. Okay. So you change the depth of the reference surface without changing the activity in B1 and sure enough you find that here if the reference, if, if the reference surface is, is there at the fixation plane then you have this high precision stereo where you can detect small changes in the depth of the probe Whereas if the surface is off fixation, you have this low precision stereo, even though nothing has changed in your V1 activity. So it seems that that change in the perceived depth somehow blocks information which would be available to V1 from reaching perception. And I think that's more intriguing because it's by no means obvious why you would want to throw that information away. And yet, apparently, we do. So that's another piece of information which gets lost, and I've labelled it here, absolute <coughs> disparity. Another point uh, that I'll uh, just touch on briefly, this is the disparity equation you saw earlier. You'll notice I had the corrugations arranged horizontally. And that wasn't an accident. Actually, it turns out those are easier to see than if you have them vertical. So if you have that kind of like curtains, you can still see those corrugations, but people are worse at it. The, disparity, the minimum disparity you need to see the corrugation is higher. Now, I think ecologically, one can understand kind of why that would be. So, in everyday life, where do we encounter these changes? Well, vertically oriented depth step might occur, say, as a doorway. So, you've got near surfaces and then this abrupt jump to much further surfaces. Horizontal oriented depth <coughs> steps will often occur in the ground plane. So whether it's actually a staircase like this or just unevenness in the rough stony surface you might be walking over. And you can imagine that <coughs> it might be much more important to be sensitive to small changes in depth where you're going to be putting your feet than to exactly how big this depth jump is when it's probably huge and out of your disparity range anyway. So I think ecologically it's clear why that occurs, but I want to sort of highlight it as an example of Apparently that's information being lost between V1 and perception because everything we know about how information is encoded in V1 suggests that that information about the vertical going to depth step should be there and yet it doesn't, some of it clearly, not, not all of it is transmitted to perception with the same faithfulness as the horizontal depth steps. Is this not something to do with sight convergence? Is that, does that not come into that at all, noise and sight convergence? No. I'm not, no, I don't think I have okay. suggested that. I'm not particularly clear I that would. I'm not clear either. I just was thinking that there was, yeah, you know, well, years and stuff we can come back to that later. Yeah. I think I actually mentioned something, not really a of that, so maybe, yeah. Within the literature as it currently stands, that I don't think that's been put forward as an explanation, but I'm certainly interested in hearing whether it is possibly a trivial consequence of budget movements. Well, so well, he know. has, somebody in Martin's lab did something or something like that, didn't they? Even or something like that, didn't they? <coughs> yeah, but the uh, Emily wanted to do something with the well. Let's come back to that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I did wonder whether I, I put a little jump in because I thought I might not be able to get <laughs> through absolutely everything. So I'll just jump to my summary slide at this point, I think. I think what I wanted to get across, I wanted to say stereo vision, 3D vision, is kind of both surprisingly good and surprisingly good, bad. On one level it's amazing, it shows high accuracy, you can detect these tiny differences, but it only works over low range of disparities and it doesn't work in very much detail. And I also hope to get across that we, we now know really an awful lot about how disparity is encoded, certainly in the early parts of the visual cortex. And that 
fundamentally mimics all our subsequent depth perception in much the same way as you know the properties of our cones limit our colour vision. A lot of information is lost between the retina and V1, and a lot more information is lost between V1 and perception. And um, yeah, it's not always easy to predict why that should be. I'm really glad we've had questions throughout the talk, but I'm certainly happy to you know, have more discussion now. So thank you. then your limits are set in disparity okay. for, wide, for longer than 50 centimetres or something. When it's close, that, then you do start to see an effect. I think it's better when it's up close, you know, when it's at That's 30, what it's I at vaguely 50. remember, but it wasn't clear why that would be. I thought that. Because the, I mean, the depth is increasing, but the, but the disparity isn't at all better for some, because some reason. Somehow, further upstream, you represent that depth differently, or yeah. something like that. So I think that there's a paper, it's in Mark Thrashill, where they, they say, oh, it's consistent with you being a minimum depth, you know, in millimetres, rather than disparity at these nearer distances. Yeah. But I'm just thinking, I've read something subsequently that argued against that, I can't remember what it was. Well, that's what I had half an hour of, and I was hoping you could fill that for me, because I'm just curious. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's a complicated thing because there's so much going on there. So one thing would be the accuracy of well, that's what so I just that's exactly what so I wanted to mention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do think that's one of the differences. I mean, certainly clinically, say in kids with intermittent dextrotropia or whatever, they <coughs> tend to perform better at near stereo than far stereo. But <coughs> I think a lot of that may be that their alignment is better when they're converged, and when they're why is there one that when they're converged then? Well, some, in some ways. <coughs> Team, is that even harder? The way I think of it, it's like the so you want to reduce the divergence climb, if you like, when you want to fixate a long way away. And they kind of overdo it and wind it down too much, and then they end up deviating. Yeah. So they're more likely to actually deviate when they were attempting to fixate something yeah. six metres away from something 50 centimetres away, presumably because 50 centimetres they can wind is that, is that much more common then at one eye? Is looking too far outwards and not too far inwards. Well, in, in intermittent exotropia, by definition, it's yeah, 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 yeah. And but isotropia, you don't tend to get an intermittent form of it. Okay. Which is interesting in its own right, isn't it? Yeah. Huh. So, well, I mean, I've got a, a more general question, which is, um, I mean, a lot of. I mean, I understand that a lot of the stimuli that you are using in your experiments and in the demonstrations that you've given us, you know, these kind of abstract visual stimuli that, mm -hmm. that are very useful for allowing to consider precise questions. Um, so I understand that. But I mean, obviously, in the real world, we're just knocking about the place and we're seeing it um, in a way that can kind of is in the visual environment. And so what... And we also know the primary means by which you sample information from the visual environment, cicadas and fixation. I know there's tracking movements and all this, but it's basically cicadic eye movements. And although you know, I work in, a, in an eye movement research, we do all this stuff about the eyes are looking here and the eyes are but we only ever record the movements of one of the two eyes, right? A critical aspect of the eye movement control is binocular coordination. Mm -hmm. So, how is this kind of information? feeding into the ocular motor control system? Ah, uh, that's such a great question. And, you know, once again, I, I fear my answer is kind of, I don't know. There's some evidence 
that the perceptual and ocular motor systems may be separate. It's not at all clear how much of this machinery that I've been talking about feeds into ocular motor. And to my mind, a great demonstration of that is a paper by Fred Miles looking at anti-correlated stimuli. I guess you probably know it without everyone. I don't, I don't know, it. actually. No. <coughs> it's a really nice one. So he has people do depth jumps in random dot stereograms, but the twist is they're anti-correlated. So you're looking at this pattern, which is say correlated, and then an anti-correlated one, you have to add to it, and it's at a different depth. So what, of course, you should be you know, diverging, but because it's anti-correlated, you actually converge a little bit, and then you correct. But you know, so in other words, how do you get the subjects? How do you ask them to do that if it's anti-correlated? Because you can't ask them to fixate at the depth of the thing, because surely they don't know what the depth is. I think what they do is, my long time to do with the paper, I think they get them to do a saccade by putting up a saccade target. And as they saccade, when they land, they flash up an anti-correlated okay. random dot pattern, which causes an automatic version to reflex. Um, and if it's a correlated pattern, it's a, a sensible reflex that works in the right direction. If it's anti-correlated, you go in the opposite direction. Okay. Which you can understand there are computer models based on cross correlating the two eyes images in which anti correlated patterns do give you reversed sign, much like you saw in that neuron, it's kind of tuning curve turned upside down. But in perception, you don't get reversed depth perception other than in certain <laughs> limited circumstances. So that suggests to me that you know, maybe there are separate neuronal mechanisms subserving these two systems. And the ocular motor one is kind of fooled by the anticorrelation, at least briefly, and the perceptual one isn't, which might be to do with latencies. You know, maybe for ocular motor, you want a quick and dirty solution, get your eyes there and sort out anything later, which of course is what happens. You realise you're moving in the wrong direction and correct. Whereas the perception, maybe you shouldn't start to perceive something, you know, for those extra few milliseconds and, and have a better chance of perceiving it correctly. I mean, it's complicated, isn't it? That's the thing that strikes me. I mean, I don't, I don't know, I don't tend to know too much about this, but it does seem to me that it's, it's very, very com complicated. Um, it's it's interesting to see the sort of plasticity in the system, though, as well. Right? So if you get the system to make saccades to targets in depth over time, you find that, that the perceptual information, the disparate information, drives a change in like a response that you can see. You know, when the system is open, more open loop mm -hmm. as well. So there's a plasticity involved that keeps the system within certain bounds, I guess, certain error bounds that it tries to hold. Um, and that seems to be a, a sort of adaptive and useful system as well. Mm -hmm.